Good morning, everyone. Thankful to be here with you all this morning. Uh, if you're a guest here with us, uh, my name is Brandon. I'm one of the pastors here at Harriet Baptist Church. We'd like to welcome you here uh, this morning. Before we begin our worship, we are going to start our time together by watching a short video on Awana uh, Kids Ministry, and then Charles Hearn is going to come share a few details about uh, what we're going to get started here at the church pretty soon, uh, as soon as the video is done. There is nothing like the wonder of a child. They are bursting with imagination, exuberance, and curiosity. We desire a place for their hearts to be filled with truth, to prepare them for the journey ahead, where they can explore the sacred and discover an eternal faith. We seek opportunities for their growth and invitations to bring heaven to earth so that they may feel empowered to spread hope, peace, and love throughout their lives. We walk with children every step of the way because a better world begins with them. Good morning, church. We've got an exciting new ministry at Harriet starting uh, Wednesday night at 6.30. It's the Awana Group, um, or Awana Clubs, which Awana stands for Approving Workmen Are Not Ashamed. And the whole program is teaching kids the Bible uh, and salvation, of course. Uh, but come out on uh, Wednesday at 6.30. We're going to have a kickoff with hot dogs and chips and drinks and to get our kids registered. And anybody that wants to be a leader or a helper, please see myself or Katie or my wife, Denise, and we can get you signed up. And this is gonna be an exciting time for our church. Thank you. Church, we're gonna begin our worship this morning by reading the, the Nicene Creed together, but I wanted to take a few moments this morning. Um, maybe we have questions about why it is that we read uh, these two ancient creeds, um, either the Nicene Creed or the Apostles' Creed once a month. And um, just a, a few things uh, very briefly. Uh, number one is that, that the reading of the creed itself uh, is an act of worship because we're confessing back to God what it is that we believe about Him uh, and about what He has done uh, in the redemption of man. It's also a, a reaffirmation of those core fundamental truths uh, that our church, that the church of Jesus Christ is founded upon. We want to continue to reaffirm those truths in the life of our church. Also, it's a sign of unity. First, our unity with other believers all over the world that are confessing these same uh, truths to be um, what they believe to be true, but also um, it is a sign of, of our unity here in this body because we are, are confessing the creed with one voice. Uh, so with that said, would you please stand with me and we are going to read this morning the Nicene Creed aloud together. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, 
whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come to you uh, this morning in the name of your Son. It is only through his name that we have access to your throne. Lord, we come to you this morning as a redeemed people, uh, as forgiven men and women. And Lord, as the Bible says, we come before you um, as your sons and your daughters. Lord, we are here to sing your praises, to worship you, to worship your great name. And we have confessed this faith together that we believe to be true, that, that we have put all of our hope in this faith um, that is, is founded on our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, as, as we open the scriptures this morning and the word is preached to us, I pray that our hearts would be ready to receive what is preached to us. Lord, this morning we're thankful for this gathering, but we pray for those who are normally with us by our side to worship, but who are not able to be with us this morning. Father, we pray for our brother Thomas as he preaches at a sister church in our area. We pray that that would be a fruitful time this morning, that your spirit would fill him. And God, we pray for this congregation as we enter into a new year, that you would be with us and, and guide us in everything that we do, that we would uh, remain on the path of righteousness, and Lord, that we would cling tightly to the gospel, and we pray all of this in our Savior's name, amen. He 
just say amen. All right, church, let's, let's try that one time. Let's just say that wasn't too bad. I think first service they uh, they 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 caught on a little faster. I I don't know. They they. I do got good news for you this morning. I am very confident that this is going to be the best sermon I preached all year. <laughs> um, next year, I mean next week, not next year. <laughs> next week, um, I think I'm going to start a sermon series through First Peter. Uh, but, but for this Sunday, the first Sunday of the year, uh, the Lord just kept bringing me back to Philippians chapter 1, and we're going to start reading in verse 3, and I can really relate to the Apostle Paul. He had a very special bond, he had a very special love for this church in Philippi, and, and the same way that I'm just so thankful uh, that God called me to this church family. I'm thankful for the honor and the privilege to be your pastor I love every single one of you, and it's honestly my desire that this would be the only church that I will ever pastor would be right here. Amen. Love y'all so much. Yep. But if you're able, let's stand for the reading of God's holy word. Start in verse 3, it says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to thank this of you all, because I have you in my heart, insomuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness, how greatly I long uh, for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me, church? Father God, I just thank you so much for the gathering today, and as Lord, as we continue to worship you. Uh, God, I just pray that you were really blessed this time spent as a church family studying your word. God, help this conform us more into your image so that we can live for your glory. So Lord, I ask that you speak in a very powerful way today and move in this place. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, and you may be seated. Now, the Apostle Paul is, is writing this church to give an update to, to this church family that he loved so much. He's in a Roman jail cell, and, and as he starts to think about his relationship and the time spent with this church, it brings great joy uh, to his spirit. Matter of fact, he, he writes in verse 3 of our text, he says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. In other words, as Paul thinks about that church family, he, he, he just thinks about the love that he has for them. As he thinks about uh, the church family in Philippi, he, he's very thankful for their love and their support. Uh, and it just leads him to have thanksgiving for God for that group of believers. Every time he thinks of them, he thanks God for them. The Apostle Paul, he had a very special relationship with this church that started 10 years earlier uh, uh, when he went there. And, and we have that recorded in Acts chapter 16. And it says the first person that he led to Christ was Lydia and her family. The second person that he led to Christ was a demon-possessed uh, slave girl. And the third person that was led to Christ was a, a Gentile Roman jailer and his family. Uh, and, and from those people, Paul planted and started a church. This church, it became a lighthouse for Christ in a pagan land. One commentary said, he begins 
a new community of healing and transformation in that city. Having a community made up of a woman, a slave girl, and a Gentile jailer was completely radical, especially if you were a Jewish male. Many Jewish, in that, uh, many Jewish men in that day would thank God that they were not a woman, not a slave, and thank God that they were not a Gentile. And it is no coincidence that the three people who we see come to Christ are a wealthy, upper-class woman from Asia, a poor, demon-possessed girl from Greece, and a middle-class prison guard from Rome. But I would like to say to you, that is exactly what makes the family of God so unique and so special. The wonderful grace of God, it, it takes people from different cultures, different backgrounds, and it brings them all together, unified, in the gospel under the headship of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. A church family is a family of people who have come from all backgrounds, and they have found unity and purpose in the family of God. And I want to tell you, that's exactly what makes Harriet Baptist such a special place. Uh, we, we are a special group of people because our common denominator uh, is our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we gather for a purpose, for fellowship in the gospel. That's all type of ways that you can find community. That's all type of ways that maybe are good things that you can find purpose in this life. There are some bad places you can try to find purpose. Some people try to find that community and what they're looking for in a bar. Some people try to find it uh, in, in sports and in different things, and it's nothing like that. But you will never ever find anything greater than the unity, the family, and the purpose being united as uh, uh, children of our Heavenly Father on a purpose, and that's to glorify Him. Matter of fact, our purpose, or you can say what our mission statement is, uh, as a church, we exist to glorify God and make maturing disciples of Jesus Christ. And, and so I just think it's important for us to discuss uh, our vision and, and who we are and why we exist as a church. And, and one of the things that this church uh, hopefully will always be, and that is a word-centered church. In other words, the 66 books of the Old and New Testament are the foundations and the ultimate source for how we know God, understand the human condition, and live rightly before God and man. So in other words, the, the, the scriptures, the, the, the word of God, it's going to always be the center of our teaching. It's always going to be the center of the preaching. It's always going to be the, the center of our worship and of our prayers. And we always want to be a Christ-exalting church. When we gather on the Lord's day, we have one purpose. We're unified under one thing, and that's to exalt our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to do. We're a mission-driven church. Jesus who commanded us and His disciples to take the message of hope and reconciliation to the nations. And for us, this is lived out as we live life. As we go, we're going to go to different workplaces. We're going to go to different schools. We're to live out our faith. And we also have opportunities in, in local outreach and short-term mission trips. And we want to be a community-focused church. We focus on this community, those in need, and how we can help people. And we also want to focus on a community that's inside these walls and a community that's outside of these walls. And it's my prayer that in 2024, we will continue to excel in these areas. I also don't want, to, want us to miss this part of verse 3. Paul says, I thank my God. Can, can you join with Paul and say with confidence that God is my God, that I belong to Him, I'm part of the family of God, I experienced His grace, He's made me a new creation that I know without a shadow of a doubt if my life came to the end of the day that I will spend eternity with Him. Do you have that assurance? 
And if not, I pray that God will reveal himself to you today, that God will begin a work in you, that he will complete on the day when Jesus Christ comes back or when we take our last breath. Do you have that confidence? And as I was reading this text this week and, and studying it, it really brought to mind to some people that are, that are very near and dear to me. It, it made me think about some men and women who, over the years, they have discipled me. Uh, they have encouraged me. They have supported me in my ministry. And, and I, I just was so thankful for them. I started calling out their names and, and just lifting them up to the Lord for the impact that they have and helped molding me and shaping me and, and pointing me into the right directions. The, the influence, the godly influence that they have in my life. I, I'm so thankful that God surrounded me with many people who have really impacted and, and touched my life. And so all I'm saying, I, I just would like to remind you or, or maybe make you think about some people that's been an encouragement to you this morning. Take time to reflect on people who, who have shown you kindness, who, who have helped you grow and mature in your Christian walk. And, and you should at, at thank God for them. I would say if it's possible, maybe send them a text or, or put a card in mail and just let them know that, that you are thankful for what they mean to you and how they have helped you in your spiritual journey and, and that, that you are praying for them and assure them. And that, that, that would be uh, just really special. This is kind of what uh, Paul is doing in the opening part of this letter to the Philippian church. And then he says in verses 4 and 5, Always in every prayer of mine making requests for you with all joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Paul had a, a, a very special fellowship. Uh, people try to, again, find this fellowship in different things. They look in different communities. But you won't find any greater purpose, any greater fellowship than when you have people united together with one common bond, and that is to have fellowship in the gospel. When Paul planted this church and was with them, they partnered together in fulfilling the Great Commission. And when Paul had to leave to go and, and, and fulfill uh, uh, planting other churches and go on other missionary journeys, they partnered with him financially. Matter of fact, in Philippians chapter 4 it says, again and again they helped support Paul on his missionary journeys. This church, they were a very giving congregation. They, they gave of their time, they gave of their resources. Through their support for Paul, they were actually partnering with God in what he was doing. The Philippians, they were senders and taking the gospel to the nation. And Paul and his companions, they were the goers. Or you could say one was the arrow and the other was the bow. You need both of them. True Christian fellowship, it is, it's not just gathering. True, true Christian fellowship is sharing in the same vision, working together to get the gospel to the world, to help those in need. I was reading in the Gospel of Mark, they, they described the gospel several different ways. Matter of fact, four different ways. In Mark chapter 1, it is called the gospel of God because it comes from God and it brings us to God. It also called it the gospel of the kingdom because it is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that brings us into His kingdom. And of course we know it's called the gospel of Jesus Christ because the gospel is the good news. It's all about Jesus Christ. He is the heart and the center of it. And without His sacrifice, without His life, without His death and resurrection, there would simply be no hope. There would be no good news. We cannot forget this part. Paul called it in Acts and Ephesians, he called it the gospel of the grace of God because there can be no salvation apart from God's marvelous and amazing grace. 
There is only one gospel, and it centers on what Jesus Christ did for you and me on the cross. I, I started to look at our budget for 2024, and, and I was just very thankful. It, it, it really blessed my heart. Uh, we partner with 13 different gospel partners, local and around the world, in support of what God is doing through their ministries. Uh, I'm very thankful that not only are we uh, are goers, but we're also senders, and we're very uh, um, united in fulfilling that great commission. And it's, it's just a privilege to be able to pastor a church like that. And, and I would say again, if you're looking for true fellowship, give yourself to being plugged in to a church family like this one. If you're looking for a true fellowship, give yourself to the gospel here in our community and around the world. Serve together with others in Bible studies, children's ministries, and youth ministries. If you're able, do short-term mission trips. If you're not able, be one of those senders and, 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 and be a part of what God is going to do through them. Join in in serving those who, who have a need. The church of Philippi was a church in which everything they did revolved around fellowship and the gospel. Maturing disciples, ministering to one another, uh, enjoying the community and the relationships they had. They gathered to be equipped so that when they left the church, they could do the work of the ministry as they lived life together. And then in verse 6, we have maybe one of my favorite promises in all of Scripture. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. I believe Paul's statement here is referring to God's work in thy salvation from the very beginning to the end, God is involved in your salvation. That, that verb, will complete, gives me confidence in the truth of the believer's eternal security. I believe if you have been truly saved, now understand this, I, if you have been truly saved, if you've been made a new creation, God started that work. And I believe with all of my heart, God will complete it. God is at work in your life, conforming you into the image of His Son. And if you can live life and you have a desire to love the world and to live for the world, you have to question it first, has God began a good work in your life? But I want to tell you, if God has begun a good work in your life, I can tell you that's a promise that you can hang your head on. He is going to bring it forth to completion. Because my confidence is not in my ability. My confidence is not in the ability of the church. My confidence is not in the Philippian believers. It has very little to do with them. What, what Paul is talking about here, his confidence has everything to do with God. Because he's the one that began the good work, and he's the one that's going to hold you through it and bring it to completion. God worked a wonderful transformation in the Philippians when he first saved them out of paganism and idolatry. Paul assures them that God who began this work will complete it. I don't know about you, but that's very comforting and reassuring to know that God is totally committed to the work that He has begun in each and one of our lives, and He's going to see that through to the day of completion. The, the conversion of a soul, it, it can happen in a miracle of a moment. But the growth of a saint is the work of a lifetime. I want you to listen to this article that I read in our Daily Bread devotional entitled, The End of Construction. One day, Billy and Ruth Graham were driving through a long stretch of road construction. They had numerous of slowdowns, detours, and stops along the way. Finally, they reached the end of that difficulty and smooth pavement stretched out before them. The sign caught Ruth's attention that said, 
in a construction. Thanks for your patience. She commented to Billy that those words would be a fitting description on her tombstone one day. And matter of fact, if you would go to the Billy Graham Library, you will see those exact uh, inscription on her tombstone. But, but, but I believe though those words fit all of us as believers because in this life, we are under construction. Uh, we're going to have speed bumps. We, we're going to have slowdowns. We, we're going to have potholes. And, and there are going to be things that, that are going to really work on us. But I want to remind you that God is going to get you through that work of construction. The Holy Spirit is in work in us to, to remove our desire for worldliness. When we become a new creation, He gives us a desire to be holy, to pursue things that are holy. He helps to remove our selfishness, to renew our thinking, and to develop qualities in us that are more and more Christ-like. And if you don't have those qualities, if you're not feeling that, you have to ask yourself, can you say what Paul says, that God is my God? Because if he starts to work in you, things are going to change. That work started in me when I was 21 years old. And I'm going to tell you, God has been at work in my life ever since that day he saved me. And I'm very thankful to know that while I'm still growing in the Lord, while he is still at work in my life through the sanctification process, in other words, while I'm still under construction, I can trust this glorious promise of God that he who began a work in me, who, who has a purpose for my life, he will complete it. And I'm looking forward to that day of completion. On that day of completion, we will finally attain complete conformity to the image and likeness of the glorified Christ. This ensures us we will never again experience bodily decay, uh, death, illness, and we will never again struggle with sin. Then in verses 9 through 11, um, Paul prays a, a prayer for the church in Philippi, and it's a prayer that I have been praying for this congregation, and a prayer that I want to continue to, to pray uh, for the people that God has called me to pastor and shepherd. L listen to Paul's prayer, starting in, in verse 9, for his partners in the gospel. In verse 9, In this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and the praise of God. In this prayer, he, he first prays that this church, that they will continue to abound, that they will continue to grow more in love. And he also prays that, that part of that abound in love, that they will grow in the knowledge of God's Word, that they will continue to grow in discernment. He's praying that, that your love would be able to tell the difference between truth and error. Uh, he, he's praying that you would be able to see what is good and bad, that, that you would be attracted to the right things, that you would be attracted to things that are holy. He, he prays for knowledge and discernment for that church family that, that would enable them to have a quick and sensitive perception to what is right and wrong and what is good and evil. And then in verse 10 of our text, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ. Paul prays for the Philippians to continue to choose the things that are best in their life and in their relationships. And that's a, a lot of good things that we can choose from in life, but God wants us to choose the best things. In, in verse 10, the word approved means much more than simple acknowledgement or agreement that something is right or true. Paul's appeal is for believers to, to study, to investigate, and determine the best possible way that they can live for the Lord, that they can obey the Lord, that they can live for His glory and live accordingly to what His standards are. There are a lot of good things that would keep us and the greatest thing that we can do 
and that is be partners in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul then prays that they would continue to be sincere. I um, heard a pastor say on this text one time in, in ancient Rome, uh, in the marketplace, uh, they would sell a lot of pottery. And uh, sometimes when, when you were making uh, the vase or, or whatever you was making out of the pottery, it, it would develop a, a small crack in it or an imperfection. And, and what you should do at that point, you, you should just discard it and, and you should start over. But sometimes uh, merchants that were dishonest, they, they would take some uh, dark wax and they would fill in that crack and then they would paint over it. And so a lot of times if, if you was a customer in this marketplace and if you was buying a piece of pottery, you might would, would grab it and you might would pick it up and you, and you will hold it to the sunlight and you would start turning it around to look to see if you could see a dark place because you knew that there could be an imperfection in it because if you, if you bought one of these uh, vases and you brought it home and, and it got too hot, guess what would happen to the wax? It would melt. And then your, your vessel, it, it would leak. And in an ordinary light, you, you couldn't see. The deception was undetectable. But, but again, when you held it up to the sunlight, it was clearly exposed and it appeared to be darker. Now, honest dealers in this day and time, they, they would put a stamp on their product that said sincere which is a guarantee that there was no defects. It was the guarantee of the highest quality. Now, just as such pottery was held up to the sunlight to reveal cracks and defects, Paul is telling the church, it's telling the leaders, it's telling the people that make up the congregation, obedient, faithful believers, we make sure that we expose our life to the sunlight of the Word of God and we don't try to cover up any defects. We, we don't try to ignore anything. We let God, who started a good work in our life, we give that to Him and we, we let Him take that from us. Unfortunately, many people, they, they try to cover their faults and their failures in various ways uh, and to, to try to appear less spiritually flawed than they are. Uh, we, we can use nice clothes when we gather on Sunday mornings. We, we can use regular church attendance. We can use giving. We can uh, use church activities. We can have the right spiritual lingo and language. But when they are severely tempted or persecuted for their faith, the crack shows. The x-rays of God's truth shows the crack in our vessels. And, and Paul is just simply praying that this church, they will continue to be a church that's sincere. That if people know that you belong to the church in Philippi, they'll be able to see that sincere believer no matter what community you're around. They'll see what the work that God has done in your life. You see, that's a pastor wheel that the world sees there's a pastor wheel that my friend sees there's a pastor wheel that my family sees and there's a pastor wheel that God sees and in all four I strive that they will see a man that is sincere in his love for them that they will see a man that is sincere in his love for a holy God and wants to do everything in his life to be in partnership and unity with like-minded believers advancing the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then in verse 11, saying he wants this church to continue to be filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. Paul is praying that this church will continue to be filled with the fruits of the righteousness, to be filled with the fruits of the Spirit. And the way that you do that, and the way you know that God has started a good work in your life, uh, is you continue to abide in Christ. You're not, you're not the seed that, that, that sprouted up and all of a sudden is, uh, died and went away. You continue. And Paul is praying that this church will continue to abide in Christ. John 15, starting in verse 4, says... Abide in me, I in you, 
as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. That is a great statement to remember. Everything that God will accomplish through this church in 2024 is what he does through us. And without him, we will accomplish nothing. Paul finishes his prayer with the glory and praise of God. That there is no higher purpose in life than glorify God in everything that we do. And so I, I want to close uh, with Paul's prayer for our church for 2024. So if you would, join me in prayer. Father God, in just a moment, we're going to stand. And as a church family, we're going to... Uh, be able to just lift up our hearts and soul uh, out of appreciation for what you have done. You have called us out of darkness. You have made us a new creation. God, you have started a good work in us. And no matter what we have to go through in this life, God, you're going to bring us through. And we thank you for that. God, I want to pray for this church. God, I pray that our love for one another will just continue to grow this year. God, I pray that you would keep us growing in our knowledge of you through your word. God, I pray that you would give us discernment to know what's right and wrong and what's bad and what's good and but what's great for our life as we live for you. God, I pray that we approve the things that are excellent. I pray, Father God, that no matter where we're at or who we're around, people will see that we are sincere. We have a desire to honor you and to live for you. God, I pray that you will continue to give us a desire to be blameless, to be pure in the days of Christ. God, I pray that you will work through this church as we abide in you to produce the fruit of righteousness that you have produced uh, the fruit of salvation through our obedience, that you have produced uh, the, the fruits of the Spirit on how we handle people, our family, our friends, and our community, the people that we work with, that they will see that you have started a great work in our life. God, help us in everything we do to bring glory and praise to your holy name. God, I pray that, that you will continue to keep this church unified through the fellowship of the gospel. And God, right now, I, I want to pray for salvation. God, if there is somebody here that, or that's listening that, that cannot say that God is my God, that the gospel is my gospel. If there's somebody here today that says, I, I know that God has not done a good work in my life. He hasn't started. God, I'm praying through the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, through the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit, that right now, God, that you would start a, a great work. A work that you will see all the way through into the day of completion. God, I'm asking you right now that you will open the eyes, the hearts, that you will plow up ground that needs to be plowed up. And someone will experience your mercy and grace. That they will surrender everything that they are. That they will be sincere in this moment. And call out your name for salvation. Confess you as Lord. Cry out for forgiveness and dedicate their life to following you. God, I'm praying that right now that you would do a good work in someone's life. That you would start the process of sanctification because they have now been justified. And that, Lord, that the weeks and months and years ahead we'll see that seed fell on good soil. 
Lord, we love you. We thank you for what you are doing in this church and what you plan to do. The altar's open. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us stand. Church, I'm going to ask real quick if y'all could be seated just for a minute. I'm, uh, we got an uh, order of business that we need to take care of. I'm going to ask Donna Etheridge if you would come on up. So as Donna is coming up, she's been coming here over a year now, and she has been uh, kind of slowly watching, uh, you know, thinking about whether or not she was going to join this church family. And so after a while, uh, this... Yep, you're okay. You're all right. We got two Donnas. I got to be more more specific. <laughs> so uh, that was pretty brave, by the way. Um, she's been coming over here thinking about whether or not to, to join this church family. And I was talking with her the other day, and, uh, and she said that, that, that she knows that this is where God wants her to be. But I want to tell you how she got there. It wasn't from my preaching. <laughs> It wasn't from my singing. You know what? She went on the women's beat trip. It was over 30 some women that, that went on this trip and she said that she would be able to tell a lot about the church about how these women interact with each other on, on a beach trip. <laughs> so I would say she was brave to, to, to go with over 30 women under one roof. That, that is uh, pretty brave. But, but she said that she was just blown away uh, about a fellowship and the unity of this church. And uh, she knew from the time that she was down there until now that this is why God has called her and this is why she wants to serve and use her gifts and talents. And uh, she, she's a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. She's been through believer's baptism. So I'm here today to present her as a member of our church family. So... 
All, all in favor? Aye. Well, it so carries. All right, well, what, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to ask Donna if she would just to stay up here uh, for a little while, and, uh, and y'all can give her the right hand of fellowship and officially welcome her as part of the HBC Church family. And let me dismiss us in prayer. So let's, let's pray. Father God, I just uh, thank you for uh, the work that you're doing in this church. Uh, Lord, I thank you for every single person that you're adding to this congregation. And uh, Lord, I just want to continue to pray for the ministry of Harriet Baptist in 2024. Lord, I, I pray that this could be maybe the greatest year of ministry that we've ever seen and how you work uh, through a group of people that uh, have one common denominator, and that's you. So Lord, we love you and ask that you just be with us as we leave. And it's in Jesus' name, amen.